right, good morning. Uh, the homework submitted here, right? And from the homework here, I don't think you need exercise example here anymore. The question though, did you do it? Did you understand it? The homework? Or if, if the examination problem is exactly like the homework, can you do it? Would it be easy for you guys? Maybe. Um, the handout for chapter for this chapter is here, so you can take it out after the the class. All right. Um, shall we start with this board first? Okay. Those parts are example. We can take. We can talk about it later. I like to start with these two equations. We derive it on Wednesday. And the first one is called equation of motion. This is equation of motion in general form. And then after you apply the assumption for the constant density and constant viscosity fluid, which is mostly liquid, then you can reduce the form here, applying new, Newton laws, and you get this equation. This equation is, is called Navier-Stokes equation. All right? And on the last class, we apply Navier-Stokes equation for two examples. And I just want, to, I just want you to see that Navier-Stokes equation in vector form can be applied in any coordination. OK? Now, in theory, in theory, if we look into this Navier-Stokes equation, OK? The term here is differentiation of velocity. So by simple meanings, even though this one is substantial derivative, but in general meanings, this term can be interpreted as acceleration, right? When you have differentiation of velocity with respect to time, that's acceleration. But in general, I mean specifically, acceleration is total differentiation of velocity with respect to time. But this one is not total differential equation. It's slightly different in terms of uh, specific meanings. But in general, you can take this part to be acceleration. So in this case, if you neglect acceleration in fluid, or if you say that fluid flows steadily, okay, with no acceleration, what you get would be something like this. Okay? This equation applies to fluids that flow really, really slow. Sometimes, for this case, for slow moving fluid, it is called stoke flow. or creeping flow. When two things happen. First is, your fluid moves slowly. That means velocity is very slow. Or, when your fluid is highly viscous. It's very viscous. So, either case, it would give you Raynaud number smaller than one, right? Because according to, to our definition, Raynaud number is what? Rho dv divided by mu. So when velocity is small or viscosity is high, Raynaud number would be small, okay? So in this case of Stokes flow, Raynaud number is smaller than one. Then you can apply this equation. Okay? It doesn't matter whether your system reach steady state or not. 
if your system is reaching steady state, this term will be dropped by itself. You can have a general case of fluid which is not viscous and flow at relatively high velocity. And you can get this equation as well as long as steady state assumption applies. But if in general, if you just neglect the term steady state assumption, this equation can be applied whether or not the system is steady whenever your flow is very slow and your flow is very viscous. Okay? This is called stoke flows. On the other hand, if you are fluid, that's the first case. The other case is called flow over submerged object. Just like when you have a ball drop from drop in the fluid, the ball would pass through a bunch of fluid. It seems like if you say the ball is fixed, the fluid would move toward the ball instead. Okay? In that case, fluid would move all over the solid. The behavior would be totally different. Okay? Anyway, in both cases, you can calculate Raynaud number just using characteristic length and characteristic velocity. Okay? By physical meanings, Raynaud numbers is a ratio between inertia effect divided by viscous effect. Inertia effects means, do you know inertia? I believe you have learned it in physics one. Probably too long. It is related to um, movement forward. Okay. On the other hand, viscous effects, viscous here is related to viscosity. Viscosity is resisting to flow. So viscous effect is something that withhold the object or the fluid um, prevent it to flow. So this one try to go forward, this one hold it back. If you have dominating inertia effects, then the whole fluid would flow forward um, with relatively high velocity. In that case, Reynolds number is greater than one. On the other hand, if you, the flow itself is slow, this cost effect dominates. When it's dominant like that, it would turn into stoke flow. Everything flows slowly, creepily. Just like when you pour honey over some inclined plane, it moves down very, very slowly. Sometimes it looks like, um, it does not look like flowing or fluid at all. It seems like um, some solid object flow or rolling over the inclined plane. That's called creeping flow, okay? Now, that's, that's just um, physical meanings of Raynaud numbers. There is velocity components, right? That velocity would go in which direction? What does it mean? Say that. So V theta here is not zero for sure because if you multiply angular velocity with the arm length here, you will get linear velocity at this particular point. And you see that at this point here, velocity in theta component is not zero. Okay? On the other hand, liquid sits still with in z direction, vz is supposed to be zero. You do not have rise of liquid level or lowering down liquid level, okay? And you should also see that we have a particular problem. Now, just for fun, if V theta is not zero, can you determine direction of the flux, momentum flux here? If we want to solve this problem, using shell balance. What does the shell look like?
Is it a circular tube? Remember, we always put the shell perpendicular to the direction of momentum transfer. We have momentum transfer in which direction? In our direction. Okay? So the thin size of the shell is supposed to be in our direction. And other size like Z direction, for this problem, there is no change in velocity in Z direction. So your shells can go from 0 to L here. Okay? What about in Zeta? Can our shell be cylindrical shell? Yes? Do you know? Yes, because V zeta here and V zeta there at different zeta are the same, right? V zeta at this one is a function of R only. It's not function of zeta. So therefore, our shell can cover zeta from 0 to 2 pi. And shell looks just like a regular cylindrical shell. Okay? Now, but in this chapter, we like to solve it by using equation. So there are two sets of equation. Equation of continuity and equation of uh, motion. For equation of continuity, this is um, form of equation of continuity written for cylindrical coordinates. You can see the notice, uh, you may notice that for this problem, I did not use a vector form. I just use a regular form simply because of the steady state assumption. And then the second term, can it be dropped? Yes, because VR is zero, so this term can be dropped. V zeta here is not zero, so this term must be kept. V zeta, VZ is zero. And again, if you assume the constant of velocity, I mean density will be constant, rho here can be taken out of differentiation and then it will be canceled with the zero on the right hand side anyway. So what you have left here would be dv zeta by d zeta equal to zero. In other words, v zeta is not function of zeta. It's, it does not change with respect to zeta. All right? Now, Second part is Navier-Stokes equation. If you assume the fluid to have constant density and constant viscosity, 